Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming out uh, on this Saturday afternoon. Uh, my name is Bill Buddington. I'm a senior staff technologist at the, at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, show of hands, how many of you know uh, the EFF? It's a good number. It's, um, so the, the EFF is uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We're uh, based in the San Francisco Bay Area, but we work both nationally and internationally uh, and have affiliates uh, such as EFA uh, Georgia and uh, uh, working uh, here locally. Uh, we kind of consist of this triforce of activists, technologists, and lawyers um, to protect your uh, privacy and security when you go online. Um, so you're, make sure that your rights follow you online. Um, you know, standing up for uh, and creating technologies like uh, Let's Encrypt, which makes it so it's free and automated to get uh, security, HTTPS, uh, for your website and HTTPS everywhere, the browser extension that you can install to make sure that you uh, access secure uh, websites instead of the insecure version of those websites, Privacy Badger, which is a tracker blocker. Um, and, uh, and this is a talk about a campaign to stop uh, killer robots from just being deployed uh, willy-nilly uh, on the streets of of uh, San Francisco and um, as dystopian as it sounds this was an actual proposal so I'm just going to kind of uh, go into the history of this campaign and how this all came about uh, so sometime last year uh, May last year there was a ballot that passed uh, in San Francisco or, sorry in California in general that made it so that any new military weapon that was given to police had to be approved by the city. Uh, California residents uh, devised a law to dismantle some of the kind of secret uh, domestic acquisition of war zone surveillance equipment. And this was something that we wanted to, it's, it's part of a more general push to have community accountability over police acquisition of war uh, war zone materials and that um, that ballot passed and as a result uh, we found out and the city of San Francisco proposed to this to the um, sorry the uh, San Francisco police force proposed to the city of San Francisco that they acquire uh, autonomous drones to deploy uh, military weapons uh, to to essentially kill robots, and as part of the bill that passed, the usage policy of that specific technology had to be enumerated and approved. Um, so the usage policy: so when can police send in a deadly robot, for instance, in the in this proposed uh, uh, usage? According to the policy, the robots listed in the section shall not be utilized outside of trainings and simulations, criminal apprehensions, critical incidents, ex comma, exigent circumstances, comma, executing a warrant or during suspicious device assessments. So a deadly robot can be used, oh, sorry, shall not be used except for X, comma, Y, comma, Z, comma. Um, I'll read that like uh, the last few are exigent circumstances uh, or executing a warrant or uh, su d during suspicious device assessments. Very nebulous language in the first case. That's a lot of events, all arrests and search warrant with warrants um, and maybe some protests they can deploy. Uh, killer robots, essentially. And when are these killer robots authorized in this proposed policy that was that the police um, were proposing to the city of San Francisco, when could the police use these robots to, to kill someone? Um, the policy read, robots will only be used as a deadly force option when one risk of life, risk of loss of life to members of the public or officers is imminent, and two officers cannot subdue the threat 
after using alternative force options or de-escalation tactic, uh, tactics options, or a or clause applied to the entirety of the previous, this or, conclude that they will not be able to subdue a threat after evaluating alternative force options and, or de-escalation tactics. Um, so this or in the policy um, plays a, a large part and um, you know, evaluating alternative force options or de-escalation tactics is not enumerated further. So the usage policy is pretty broad and open-ended um, as proposed. Originally in November uh, 2022, when this was proposed uh, before the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco, uh, it was approved uh, 8 to 3. And we were very concerned about this development, deploying killer robots on the streets of San Francisco uh, in a nebulous range of circumstances, to put it lightly. And um, we raised the Claxon call um, and uh, wrote a series of blog posts on this and uh, gathered uh, partner organizations and had a protest before the steps of uh, the San Francisco City Hall uh, with uh, and started a petition um, with concerned citizens about this policy. And uh, as a result of numerous thousands of people signing that petition and a large media cycle pointing out the dangers of deploying killer robots, um, we were able to get the get you know certain supervisors to change their opinion on this and in December 2022 um, when they went to finalize approval so there's a, there's a preliminary vote and then a finalized uh, approval then the eight to three became an eight to three against this measure so it's an example of uh, successful activism when people, view these dangers as real dangers and uh, took action um, to say we are not going to stand for killer robots on the streets of, of San Francisco just um, because, um, you know, the police want it. And, and so um, that was uh, because of, you know, not only our campaign, but the members, the members that, that took action had, you know, concerns about, about this happening um, before their very eyes. Um, so fighting dystopia is sometimes happens piecemeal fighting dystopia means starting small campaigns that sometimes blow up into big campaigns and uh, everyone getting together to say hey wait no this one measure uh, that makes that is a slippery slope towards um, you know autonomous robots um you know, being deployed, that's a really scary development and we don't want it. And that means people stepping up and having their voices heard every step along the way. And so, you know, fighting dystopia isn't just, you know, uh, uh, you know, a la uh, Star Wars Rebels uh, fighting the evil empire, which I would love. Uh, and I love rebels. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, being at a, a con like this is very heartening um, to see so many creative and passionate minds, um, you know, and uh, and and really um, people that have their hearts in the right place. And I think that that passion for not having a dystopian future really came out in this campaign as well. Um, so itinerary. Um, so yeah, some of the kind of dangers that come to mind are not only when will it be authorized to deploy killer robots, um, but to me, one of the huge dangers is the possibility of killer robots being hacked and having uh, the communication line between, say, the... Uh, office of you know the central office of police and then the killer robots that being either cut off or or specific failure modes 
causing dangerous situations. So if killer robots, um, for instance, you know, uh, are not able to communicate with home base and they're auto then they're maybe automatically sent back to the police station or, um, but then uh, communication comes back up and then they are redeployed. And so someone, for instance, a clever slash extremely malicious hacker might be able to send them to a specific point anywhere between the police station and where they're being deployed. And then you have a bomb, perhaps, uh, which is basically by uh, specially crafted signals able to be guided by a malicious hacker to anywhere between where those two points are. So a lot of these instances when you have robots where there is an autonomous function involved in their operation, uh, they go into failure modes that you don't expect. You've seen that even with autonomous vehicles in San Francisco where they're running over uh, people because they don't, you know, they don't, they have unexpected failure modes. And these are autonomous vehicles that don't have any weapons embedded in them. Uh, and so there has to be a extremely high standard uh, and continuous human oversight for the deployment of force. And that only happens when you have someone on the ground that is able to stop something disastrous from happening. Um, a lot of the debates between the well, what happened on the San Francisco uh, Board of Supervisors is that they th there was a claim that um, oh well if this technology were was deployed in Las Vegas during the Las Vegas shooting in 2017 then um, it could have saved a lot of lives well it's unlikely that police would want to blow up a bomb uh, in a hotel in Las Vegas it probably would result in a lot more loss of lives, uh, yeah, especially combined with the arsenal that that killer had. Uh, so the kind of cavalierness which this is treated is dangerous. Um, the readiness for police to deploy these technologies uh, in situations uh, just because it's, oh, it's a cool new military technology uh, is is frightening and in this case we were able to stop it uh, yeah sure yeah to my understanding it is a uh, a drone that is carrying a, 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 a bomb essentially that they were trying to get approved um, and of course, the, you know, once one technology of that sort is approved, then it's a slippery slope because other technologies of that ilk can be also um, more readily ap approved, citing the, you know. Uh, sure, yeah. yeah that was uh, what, what uh, technology was being proposed uh, specifically and yeah and this you know, kind of killer robots is, is typically kind of drones carrying uh, explosives uh, and you know you can kind of see that like they're they're thinking of exigent circumstances but they're not thinking about the dangers of everyday you know hacking that can occur in these circumstances and so having a real human able to stop, have a sensible, you know, uh, uh, level of, uh, 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 and, and stop something disastrous from happening is a very important one. Um, yeah, and having that proper oversight. Um, again, like uh, th this, uh, 
is part of a, a overall initiative of what we call, and some cities have, is called CCOPS, which is Community Control Over Police Surveillance. And there's police surveillance more more than autonomous robots um, that are killing people um, that, that we've kind of uh, targeted. But, but now these proposals for uh, killer robots are coming up. Um, so uh, before getting to questions and answers, which we will get to, um, I wanted to open up a, to the floor a question of what, what is the most dystopian technology that you can imagine? <laughs> uh, because for me, this is close to it. Um, anyone care to raise their hands and uh, think of dystopian technology? Yeah. Mind control. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. If there. It's actually something that's already been a thing, and it's. I don't know if I can see. Can you come to the I don't even know if I'd consider it dystopian necessarily, but something that's been already becoming prevalent is the fact that you can buy cars that you basically have to pay for like DLC that's already installed in like for example these Teslas which I have strong feelings about Elon Musk but um, the fact that you can buy them and then you have to pay extra to let them go faster even though the fact that it can, it can already do that but you have to you're, you're paying the company you already bought the car from to access something that's inside the car or for example like I think that there's one now where it's like it has heated seats but you can't use them unless you pay extra even though they're already there that's pretty ridiculous to me. Yeah, I think. function gating, function gating uh, yeah. technologies before you know under a pay paywall. Like it, yeah, it's the, it's the fact it's different when it's a digital device because for example they're like downloading it on it. But for example, the physical components are already there. Like I don't know, it's that's just that really bothers yeah. me. I don't yeah. know. I know. I, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to seem like I'm just like airing grievances, but like I no. feel like this I, is. I am. I am equally as annoyed about that. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> And uh, can I, uh, you know, uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you have a comment? I mean, our cars are, our cars are hackable. Modern cars have internet connections that the hack, hackable, the option to hack them has been exposed. So yeah. someone with the means can remote control your car. That's yeah. There's, there's uh, every year at, at DEF CON, uh, Information Security Conference, there is a car hacking village um, that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, teaching people to point out the vulnerabilities in these systems uh, to the companies that are developing them. And uh, this is important. I mean, it's a separate part of our work, uh, but at EFF, we encourage companies to treat security vulnerability disclosures uh, to companies as a gift to them rather than trying to prosecute those that point that point out those vulnerabilities often they think oh my god a hacker is trying to target us no they're just pointing out a flaw in your product and that flaw could result in uh, real dangers loss of life in some cases so uh, we want to have an atmosphere, and some of the largest companies have started, uh, you know, bug bounty programs, where they will reward uh, security researchers for pointing out vulnerabilities in their systems. Um, unfortunately, that's not universally the case, and some of the companies are more uh, ready to uh, exert prosecutorial um, power against those that are pointing out the flaws in their system. Yeah. There's one sort of related to that. Uh, there's a recent push uh, for electronically secure firearms. Mm -hmm. So the government can't really, the government can hack into it unless it potentially, it can't make you point it in the wrong direction, but it could turn it off. Right. It could turn into it, you could break it. Yeah, yeah. There's this uh, idea that the Snowden revelations, and Snowden himself pointed out of uh, turnkey tyranny. Um, which means that um, you might have an adversarial government that is um, able to, at the turn of a key, uh, disable your devices, uh, access to information, or uh, even um, 
uh, defensive equipment. Um, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. This uh, this idea, this uh, program that was implemented in mainland China, um, that that was your social credit score. So if you're a good, upstanding member of, you know, uh, of of China, and and their programs and uh, policies, then you will uh, have a generally more easy time to navigate society. And uh, if you don't, then Obstructions will be put in your way at every cup turn. To yeah. uh, carry on with other things that go on in the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. um, it, it seems almost naive, even to use the word dystopian anymore, when you consider the level of surveillance that's going on in, say, Western China, where the, the Muslims in the Rumki and, you know, Xinjiang and all that yeah. are literally tracked down to the words in their emails and you know neural network token searching is used to find objectionable phrases um, and then now <laughs> in countries that rhyme with Prussia um, <laughs> they use a kind of almost a WeChat modeled central application and they have now adopted instead of sending letters to come join the army and fight in a war you don't want, to notifications that you are required to open in said app when you go to pay your phone bill or your power bill. Um, so great dystopia, yeah, 1984, but here we are in 2023 and this is happening right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You think of that, um, you know, security vulnerabilities that are uh, that allow those that um, are that, that that have those vulnerabilities to create exploits and to um, hack into, for instance, our phones. We know that there is uh, stockpiling of vulnerabilities within government, uh, and sometimes they give those vulnerabilities to you know the NSA. They develop those vulnerabilities, and then they uh, might, in some cases, give them to the um, uh, the Department of Defense or the, or the DEA. We've seen instances where they give given the vulnerabilities to the DEA to deploy against. And now there are contractors um, that the government uses. Uh, you know, you might have heard of Pegasus, the Pegasus malware, and that was widely deployed against journalists, human rights defenders in Mexico, and Saudi Arabia, and various other countries, and. Um, you know, uh, under the auspices that, uh, oh, yeah, we're, we're using this uh, against uh, the drug cartels, but no, they weren't. They were using them against political opponents. Not only, yeah, not only uh, human rights defenders, but even political opponents in uh, Oberdor's uh, campaign uh, in 20, I think it was 2016. So, um, so yeah, uh, using our devices against us. This is why it's important to not have government oblige us to download and open apps, like you said, uh, having safeguards that are developed by the device manufacturers because they're, continu they're continuously developing security upgrades and security uh, patches uh, and deploying them to our phones. And sometimes those security patches maybe blocked by a government that doesn't want us, the latest and greatest, to be on our phones to defend us. So that's a real danger. Yeah. And that's, you know, the nexus, not to bring it down too much, but the nexus of, uh, of surveillance and uh, deadly force and uh, social control mechanisms uh, is, is frightening. And my hope in this talk for, is for people to come away with the idea or the fact that at least here and at least for the moment, you can fight back. You can successfully launch a campaign that starts to 
rein back some of the worst and most dystopian measures uh, of our of our society, and um, and that's what we're working towards. And um, and we hope you'll join us. Um, we our our work just to kind of do a short plug, um, EFF.org, and we're a donation-based organization. Um, so if you go to EFF.org slash donate. Um, that helps us support our work and, uh, and kind of fight back against the dystopian future that we all have, have uh, perhaps looming over us, perhaps not, if we do the right things and, and um, you know, fight back the right ways. Yeah. All right. Going back to what she was saying about this killer robot stuff with a bomb on it. Yeah. Not a killer robot with a taser or a billy club or a megaphone, yeah. but a bomb. Yeah. And you're saying that the council, eight to three, approved a robot with a bomb mm. that could just blow up at any time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm not sure if the problem is so much <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. hackers or the robot as it is the council that thought it was a good idea you, you, you know what I'm saying I mean because what they do about them I mean they got rid of the robot and said no nah, that's not a good idea for right now because Terminator didn't come down or the aliens didn't come down or you know whatever but the only reason they reversed it was because of the EFF and people saying, no, that's not a good idea. And them saying, you know something, just because a whole bunch of people are yelling at us we, and we don't like to be yelled at, we'll change it. But that still has nothing to do with the killer robot with the bomb that's sitting in a warehouse waiting to be deployed. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Yeah. And the warehouse is uh, military technology is being deployed, you know, and that, that are given to the city. I mean, uh, because you yeah. still have Raytheon, Boeing, yep. you know what I'm saying, yeah. Lockheed, all these different companies that still build these weapons, and it's not so much the weapons themselves as it is the individuals ignorant enough to deploy it or not having enough common sense or consciousness to say, you know, that's not a good idea to send a robot with a bomb on it that may blow up between point A or point B mm. or I mean, they could have put a taser on it or something, you know? No. But you're talking about it being deployed for a warrant, you know, searching just under normal circumstances. Yeah. There have to be uh, more stringent safeguards. So, so, if I recall correctly, the robot itself didn't have a bomb on it. It was a bomb disposal robot. And there was a situation in which there was a shooter and the police created a makeshift C4 explosive that took it towards the shooter. What instances is this? This was reported in the uh, San Francisco Police, Washington Post, September 2022. This is, uh, this is, the, proposed, this is the proposed legislation. Uh, so w they were no, this wasn't proposed. I was saying that there, the robot that was used in 2022, the incident that the San Francisco Police, that horrified everybody, was the fact that the robot didn't have a bomb on it at the time. Okay. Police created the bomb to disable a shooter. And that's, I believe, what there's some confusion on. Yeah, there's a... It, 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 I think that, uh, the cops no, in Dallas blew somebody up in 2016. Yeah, uh, yeah 2016, yeah. Dallas bomber is... Because, you know, Texas didn't, doesn't have any... The, so that was the, um, uh, the case where... Um, 2016. Oh, that was a 2016. Yeah, there was a different Dallas bomber. Well, yeah, uh, it was like a police. police yeah, yeah, it shot five police. Uh, the blo um, police uh, detonated a bomb robot, an unprecedented uh, tactic by officers in, in 2016. It was uh, Micah Xavier Johnson, who shot dead five police officers and wounded seven others in Dallas. Uh, and that was uh, a case where the state of Texas didn't have any. Uh, you know, uh, any any oversight of this, but um, but I think that you know they would have viewed that as an exigent circumstance for sure. 
but um, you know, in 2017, this uh, Las Vegas bomber was they they could have deployed it in in a, in a hotel, you know, and uh, would have caused a lot of a lot of damage. This was, uh, yeah, uh, technologies that are deployed should be. Um, should, they, they should have stringent safeguards and not so many clauses that are just like or a search warrant or a uh, you know and some uh, you know uh, 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 you know the execution of a of a uh, of a search warrant or, or something that is that is uh, as trivial as that because what is going to happen is that they're go there's going to be unforeseen circumstances where these technologies are deployed and it's going to, without those stringent safeguards, it's going to harm someone. Um, so I'm confused. Um, uh, I didn't know. Uh, is police use of, of bombs outside of flashbangs, like, is police use of bombs common? If so, do they have remote control bombs? Because that sounds a way, not that I like the idea in general, but that sounds way safer than an autonomous bomb. Yeah, um, so this is this is this specifically was for remote control, not autonomous. But the autonomous function comes in when, for instance, the moving. communication is cut off between the operator and the bomb, okay. uh, and the autonomous or the uh, the the, uh, the the drone. And so, you don't want a, just a drone hovering without a line of communication. So they're okay. Well, let's bring that back to the. But then again, you can have hackers that easily can control you know, where along the line that is. Sure. Why do the police need explosives? Like, in what situation do you need to blow something up? <laughs> Unless you're trying to... In general, police should be peacekeepers and hold themselves up to that name, I agree. Uh, I think that there may be some circumstances that, um, that they need to stop a terrorist or something like that sure but uh, <laughs> that happens a lot but yeah yes I, you know exactly it, it, it's not very common and it shouldn't be so cavalierly deployed as it as it certainly is uh, already you've seen the history of police misconduct where you know for instance uh, in Philadelphia they um, in the 80s they deployed a bomb against the house of the move the, the uh, uh, move activists and in Philadelphia, that was in the 1980s, 85, I believe. And it not only killed several people in that house that they targeted, but burned down the entire block. And, uh, you know, dozens of people were killed as a result. And not people that were involved in any activism, not even people that were involved in any activism that were already targeting just because they were activists, uh -huh. but just a, a city block that... Um, that were, but there were uh, lives that were devalued because there were people of color. Uh, that was that was the case in Philadelphia in 1985, move bombing. So that's that's the the cavalier targeting of and the the, the kind of ease to which police resort to militarization and, and weaponry and killing people is uh, a broader problem uh, uh, and one that I am very much against personally not specifically uh, within the scope of killer robots though but yeah in general I agree yeah have they ever suggested what you considered a reasonable circumstance in which a not not just a bomb to blow a door, although you're right, that's a thing. Mm -hmm. But a bomb to destroy a room was smart? Uh, it's, it's extraordinarily like, common. Yeah. If you found a UPS package in the middle of the street down there, uh -huh. you're not going to send the cop out there to open it and lose his hand. You're going to take a robot and put a small bomb next to it, which disrupts the package and disrupts the bomb. That is extraordinarily common. So we're talking that about small... Way of dealing with a bomb I'm not sure what the police. size of the bombs that they're proposing was, but... Okay. Six mason jars full of a, a fruit tree come into his home country with, and she thought that they would scan it and find, she's going to put some cash. She got the cash in tin bowl. The cops blew it up in, into the Atlanta airport because you had six mason jars full of fluid 
So yeah, there might be cases where there's a dangerous uh, package that they need to blow up. Um, this is, uh, yeah, I think that when there's some, you know, human element that is involved in the decision-making process, um, especially uh, when it is not deployed against humans, um, there may be certain circumstances where, where you know, you have uh, uh, something, a package that needs to be destroyed um, uh, without, but it, again, it needs to, the circumstances where that is deployed need to be very, very closely checked. And the, the, the technologies that are being acquired need to themselves be put through rigorous security tests. And as of last year, even in the liberal bastion of San Francisco, you didn't even have any oversight, community oversight, you know, uh, of police acquiring these technologies from the military. And it speaks to the increasing militarization of police in general in this country. Um, but luckily now we have something as of May 2022, at least in our city, we have, in San Francisco, we have a, a uh, law in place that requires oversight when they're acquiring military technologies. Um, and sometimes supervisors are not quite as diligent as they should be when they approve these technologies and they require some sort of a, hey, what the fuck? Sorry, my language. But uh, they require a, uh, a, uh, a little check uh, when it comes to um, the, the way that they had just passed that. Well, these old, 10 years old, a year old. This is question is, how, how do you distinguish what a military technology is? Sure. These were, these were developed, these, tech, you know, specific technologies were developed in military application, uh, first deployed uh, overseas and uh, in war zones. Um, so that's, I think, that one clear. There might be ambiguous circumstances as well. But... Um, And this is why we need to have democratic control over the processes, because that distinguishing characteristics uh, between, you know, tampons and killing somebody with a military drone are, uh, there's a lot of gray zone there, and we need to have people that have sensible minds and to have a, a democratic process over the controls of, of what gets deployed and when. And... Uh, this is not something that's an easy, uh, an easy choice. Yeah. Maybe to uh, clarify the military technology, it's not so much that something was developed a long time ago. It's a lot of it is military surplus that, oh, what are we going to do with it? Well, let's give it to the police. Yeah. That's the stuff, like the armored handcrafts and mm -hmm. other equipment, the guns, all that surplus is going to the police. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of the major things is that, we, you know, uh, regardless of what you think about overseas wars, this deadly technology that is meant to uh, harm people is uh, just because there's too much of it does not mean, quote, unquote, in, I would agree, agree that there's too much of it, but uh, that doesn't mean that you should simply hand them over to what's supposed to be protectors of the peace. How do you make a distinction between, let's say you have a UPS drone that's delivering my box of loud Hawaiian shirts. The UPS drone doesn't know it's in the box. So it, without killing the, its ability to deliver me my 
crazy Hawaiian shirts, you can't stop it from delivering a, an identical cardboard box with bad things. Try to answer your question. Yeah. All right. There is a division between military and, you know, peacekeeping. If it's military, it's pretty much just to kill. That's all. I mean, it's made specifically to kill, destroy, eliminate. If it's peacekeeping, it's going to be something where there's a margin of trying to subdue or, you know, um, restrain all the way up to, you know, using force, but not necessarily to take life. But if it does so, something to the extreme. Um, pertaining to my man's comment back there, in terms of UPS drones, and this, again, going back to the whole eight to three with the bomb, you know, the whole, why does a drone, if you're going to deploy a drone to go investigate my man's box, or, you know, a box of, you know, fruit goods, if you don't know, why would you put another bomb on that to exterminate it versus just simply use a robot drone just to open up the box. If it's a bomb in the box, the drone will get destroyed, regardless of whether there's a bomb on the drone itself. Yeah. Or carry it away. Or, or to carry a it away. Yeah. If, I mean, why would you? So it goes back to the counts of the fools that keep coming up with these ideas <laughs> that, I mean, we're, we're, we're focusing on the robots, and the robots ain't do nothing to us until we actually move them in a direction and sacrifice the robot, get it destroyed, whether it's on television or in war, but the fools driving it, we, we overlooking. You know, I mean, maybe that's just me, but I like my UPS box. <laughs> you know, and if it is just some fruits, we shouldn't have a drone or a robot with a bomb on it to poke it and because the box does not talk, blow up the box and say, <laughs> you know, I guess it wasn't a bomb, or yeah. I guess it was a, you know. Yeah. It, it seems that there are easier ways than that. While the technology is increasing, there is no consciousness mm. behind directing the technology. And, and going back to, thank you, go, going back to the unforeseen circumstances case, where a drone, might, you know, just carrying a bomb, might encounter a firework in the sky and think that it's under attack, and or maybe that an active shooter is in the vicinity, and um, because of that, it would detonate this bomb. There's plenty of instances where you think these technologies are infallible because they're technologies, um, especially when it comes to machine learning. God, everyone thinks, oh. But the machine learning did it, so it must be good. <laughs> but um, but there's plenty of fail failure modes uh, where they're going to see a firework and think they're under attack and just cause an explosion. And that is not possible when it's not armed with a bomb. Simply. I'm uh, not sure how serious I am about this, but in, respo in response to what he was saying about the council, uh, have the robots open the council's mail. <laughs> when they feel comfortable with that, then they can deploy it somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I don't have anything useful, just. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually wanted to highlight something you mentioned earlier about the importance of a democratically controlled process, yep. just about the distinction between all these different types of drones or maybe like a delivery drone. Like there's not, it's not a given that we have to accept making those legal either. We could all decide that it's okay to wait for your loud Hawaiian shirts and that we don't need drone delivery drones flying throughout a city just to get you your shit faster <laughs> yeah. like which would be my personal opinion i don't yeah. think we probably need that yeah. democratize democratize all the things i'm in favor of that for sure um any uh closing questions uh, thanks very much uh it's been a pleasure 
to be here and um i have another talk at seven and another at ten and <laughs> happy to uh to uh to be here and uh and uh come down to the booth um which is one floor uh down and um and uh we can uh get uh some eff swag if you want or uh talk with christian who's uh who's uh, staffing the booth and um and uh, get more information about our campaigns. And we are also have these uh, EFF, nice little EFF badges as well that are free. So yeah, thank you very much.